Thanks for tuning in to Poured Over, the Barnes & Noble podcast. My name is Chris Gillespie. My guest today is the Pulitzer Prize winning author of such novels as The Overstory and Bewilderment. He has an excellent new book out this fall entitled Playground. Please join me in welcoming back to the show, Richard Powers. Richard, how are you doing? Doing very well. It's a beautiful day down here in the Smokies. The fall weather is starting to move in. Couldn't be happier. It's delightful. Yes. Well, well overdue, ready for it. I appreciate you being with us today. I had the pleasure of reading an advanced copy of Playground, and my mind is spinning with everything that I want to discuss with you. But before we do that, would you mind telling the listeners at home a little bit about what it's about? Well, Playground is a novel uh, whose central dramatic conflict uh, is over the fate of the island of Makatea, which is a real-life island in the archipelago of uh, French Polynesia in the center of the Pacific Ocean. Uh, Makatea was one of uh, a small handful of what are referred to as the Pacific Phosphate Islands. There were three or four of them. Uh, These were islands where vast uh, deposits of phosphate rock, phosphorus and rock form, uh, were discovered in the 19th century. And that became absolutely crucial for the maintenance of a world whose burgeoning population was increasingly difficult to feed. It turns out that phosphorus is a necessary component for fertilizer, and fertilizer is a necessary component for Uh, the kinds of population growth uh, that uh, the world uh, saw over the last two centuries. So these were tiny little Pacific islands that were literally being consumed uh, and dug up and and shipped all over the world. Uh, So Makatea suffered tremendously in the first half of the 20th century as part of this kind of uh, extraction effort to send vast amounts of the island itself to other countries who then profited from it in manufacturing food necessary to feed their populations. So on top of that sort of uh, first wave of of colonialism, the island is now uh, confronted with the possibility of of a second wave of exploitation in the form of seasteading. Uh, which, again, is a real-world plan, very favored by a lot of the Silicon Valley elites for creating floating cities that would then sail out into international waters and uh, escape the jurisdiction and the regulation of all nation-states. It would be kind of a new form of government, a new form of industrial enterprise. And uh, Makatea is presented with this referendum uh, over whether or not they want to be a base for the creation of these uh, seastead enterprises. And that's the the central drama of the book. However, uh, this being a Richard Powers novel uh, (laughs) requires uh, two or three other frames uh, to complicate it. and. These are not, at the beginning of the book, are not initially connected to that central drama. It's not clear what the relationship between these narrative frames are. One involves a a French-Canadian woman who, shortly after the Second World War, becomes one of the very first people to use the aqualung, the infant invention of Jacques Cousteau. That frame tells the story of her life very long life devoted to marine biology. And these uh, incredible discoveries that were made possible by this invention that permitted our first extended stays in the ocean, our first extended visits. Uh, The third frame involves two Chicago boys, one white North Sider, one black South Sider, who both end up at an elite high school and who are both outsiders and who are both uh, in love with uh, the use of their intellects in competitive and combative ways, especially in the form of board games. And they form this precarious friendship that takes them through high school and into college, a a kind of push-pull friendship uh, bound together over uh, their mutual sparring, but also mutual respect 
but as they they pursue their separate paths, uh, Todd Keene, the white North Sider, uh, getting deeper and deeper into computers, the infant uh, digital revolution that's uh, taking over the world as he comes of age, and uh, Rafi Young, uh, the black South Sider who falls in love with literature uh, and poetry and who wants to understand himself through words. As their paths diverge, their friendship becomes more and more tested uh, until it finally spins out. Now, the relationship between those three frames is uh, uh, obviously part of the mystery, part of the suspense that's uh, propelling uh, the reader forward into the book. Uh, but these frames do come together in a very surprising way by the end of the story. I would agree with that. I did not see, I knew that they were going to converge at some point, uh, theoretically at some point in the book, but the way that they do at the ending, I did not see coming at all. And I was uh, really astounded. And um, yeah, it's a really terrific story and it is complicated. And it's multifaceted, and I hope to try to touch upon as many of those topics as we can today. Um, there is so much to unpack and discuss. I to start out, I'm kind of curious about when you started working on this manuscript or this book because it feels like so much of it is ripped from the current headlines, and it feels super topical. Is this something that's been years in the making, or just a few months? What's your writing process like for this kind of thing? Well, you know, uh, each one of my 14 novels, uh, I've been publishing them over now, uh, of course, of 40 years. Hard for me to believe, but uh, they each start while I'm still involved in the previous one. Mm. And, you know, it's, it's like you spend uh, two or three or four years, sometimes longer, uh, writing a book, and that book uh, pushes forward into into very interesting questions, topics, techniques uh, that you can't really get to inside the the, the frame that you've set for the book uh, as you're currently working on it. So these these problems kind of get set aside um, during the writing and revision of any given book. But they're also gestating in my head uh, so that by the time I finished Bewilderment, for example, I already had a, a, a series of, of uh, images, a series of uh, dramatic tensions and, and, and also themes that in some strange way con continued or extended my preoccupations in Bewilderment, but took it into a, a, a very different place. So an honest answer to the question would be saying I was actually working on it in one sense, in a subconscious sense, even while uh, you're putting the finishing touches on bewilderment. But your your remark that you know the the book, <laughs> you know it it it's a it's a longish and uh, involved story which took a fair amount of time to write, uh, but at the same time seems to be predicting or exploring things that have just happened in the world. I, I think that's true. And I think in, in, to explain that, I'd have to say I got incredibly lucky because mm -hmm. the things that I was preoccupied with and that I wanted to build my story around had this sudden efflorescence while I was working on the book that quite clearly steered me toward the only available way of bringing them to fruition and, and deploying them in a narrative. So it's like, well, I can't claim to be especially prescient, um, but I, I, I think sometimes if you, if you look closely at what's happening right now uh, and begin to write about it, that by the time you've reached two or three years into the future, the explanation for your story is there waiting for you. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And I think to clarify for the listener who hasn't read the book yet, obviously things uh, like colonization and explo exploitation of our natural resources have been going on for a very long time. But some of the things that Richard's talking about in the new book involve artificial intelligence, generative AI, um, seasteading, which is not something that is a hot button issue right now, but is certainly something that feels 
uh, uh, topical or certainly plausible in the current moment. Um, so there are those things that feel very fresh and topical and forward looking. I know the book itself kind of looks a little bit further into the future than where we are right now, but it feels very grounded and realistic and kind of the logical extent extension of where things could go in a way that doesn't necessarily feel like it's science fiction or super far-fetched. It feels like a very grounded approach to the future. Um, since you are, your stories and your novels are at the intersection of science and technology, but then also kind of the humanities or sort of society, those human stories. I was wondering when you're conceptualizing or you're working on novels, is there one of those pieces that kind of manifests before the other piece? Like, are you thinking about, wow, I would really like to tell a story about two kids from Chicago uh, who are growing up and have these kinds of this interesting relationship? Or are you thinking about, I kind of want to tell a story about seasteading and maybe AI and how that goes and how do I add the human element to that? Yeah, it's tough. It's tough to answer that question. Uh, mm -hmm. both succinctly and honestly you know you can you can do one or the other you can even mm. kind of collapse okay. it into a into an answer that fits into the uh you know the the finite amount of time we have but actually distorts probably a, some element of the process or you can you can do justice to the complexity of the process and and take uh, several hours in doing it but you know the th the thing is these you know, novels are 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 very complex machines. You know, they are like uh, watersheds. You know, they're like, they're like a big river. When you say, "Where did the river start?" It starts in a thousand different little tiny tributaries. And in in some ways, this book started when I was ten years old, and my mm. and my and my older sister gave me a book about the coral reefs while I was living on the north side of Chicago, and just couldn't wrap my head around how the planet could be both those suburban homes that were outside my window, you know, as far as the eye could see, and these bizarre alien creatures, you know, it, it psychedelic colors and shapes and it, it, impossible to, to comprehend behaviors. Uh, you know, so that's, that's me, that, that's little Ricky at the age of 10 trying to make sense of the world. And in a sense, this book, you know, that that I finished at the age of sixty-seven, you know, more more than half a century later, is a continuation of that of that little kid's preoccupations. In, in some ways, the story of this friendship between Todd and Rafi is a is a like personal psychoanalysis on my part because they they represent a split aspects of my own personality so when i set them up in this in this competitive friendship between the humanist and the technocrat it's really a, a kind of uh vicarious therapeutic reworking of this this crisis that has been in me since the beginning of my life which way do i go how do i understand the world do I do it through the you know the processes of science and mathematics, or do do I do it through the through the apprehension of of poetry and words? But all that said, I think I think the actual to go back and answer your question is now is too it's too late to be succinct, but <laughs> uh, to answer your question um, about the heart and soul, I would say what I really wanted to do was write a book about the ocean. And when I was young, I spent, you know, maybe five or six years from the age of 11 to the age of 16 or so thinking I would be an oceanographer. And so in, in one sense, this book is a recreation of that childhood dream. In that regard as well, in being about the ocean and about a part of the planet that we really don't ever get to experience in anything like its totality, it's an extension of the overstory and bewilderment. Both books, all three of these books put together, I think, are a kind of trilogy about living on Earth. You know, trying to find in the novel form some way of of defeating this narrative of human exceptionalism that our 
what we inherit from our culture. This idea that we're really the only interesting game in town. You know, the, the rest of the world is here basically as an extension of our own project. We can understand ourselves entirely through psychology, sociology, politics. And that the, the, the rest of the world basically is a, is a small subsidiary of us, right? These three novels taken together are trying to invert that, are trying to get back uh, to a, a kind of way of knowing the world, of telling stories about the world that dominated the human story for most of the human story, which is to understand ourselves as a small subsidiary of the rest of the living world. So, you know, to, to, write, a, to write a novel about the ocean is to put front and center this fact that 99% of the livable area on this planet is underwater. And that life in the ocean had been going on for billions of years before large life ever came up on land. So if we want to understand ourselves, if we want to understand you know, our origins, our psychologies, our behaviors, our relationship to the rest of the non-human world, the more than you, we want to understand where we really are living, what home we actually have to accommodate, our stories have to acknowledge that this planet is a, is a water planet. And whatever we're doing to it, you know, its fate is going to be decided in the water. What kind of research did you have to do to, because I, I mean, I'm, when I was reading the book, I was struck by how colorful and vivid the descriptions of the underwater passages are and the undersea creatures. And I found myself getting emotional reading them because they're just so beautiful and you are shedding a light on this part like you said of our planet that we're not thinking about and that we don't even have visibility to and no one's considering what's going on under the water or the sea creatures that are down there we just think of it a lot of times from the you know human centric perspective of oh that's where we get food and that's where we get fish and uh, oh that's also where we dump our garbage but there are so many instances of the non-human other who are down there, but then also that the ocean is such an important part of the delicate ecosystem that is our entire planet. I was so curious, have you been scuba diving before? Like, did you actually go underwater for this? I should, I should tell you uh, that the, the, the continuation of the story that I started about this 10-year-old kid with the book on coral reefs looking out his mm -hmm. suburban Chicago window, the next year, my school principal father took a job in Bangkok, Thailand. So he brought this family of five kids halfway around the world, and I started another life in Southeast Asia. You know, by the, by the time I turned 11, I was scuba diving and snorkeling in the South China Sea in these reefs that had only been available to me through this kind of magical book a year before. So... A lot of the book, again, is a recreation of my own relationship to the ocean when I was younger, the one that made me think that I was going to grow up to become a marine scientist. But I, got, I have to tell you, Chris, to hear that you got emotional reading these passages of descriptions about uh, the world underwater, it, it sounds like you're my ideal reader, because I really do think that a book like this is going to live or die by whether or not people can respond not only to the human stories, you know, Rafi and Todd and Evelyn and, and you know, these, these people who are doing the conventional drama uh, interaction that, that novelists, you know, have as their bread and butter. But the ideal reader can not only feel connected to those dramas, but can feel a bigger drama, a larger drama, and perhaps a more emotionally overwhelming drama that's unfolding between human beings and the living planet. You know, to, to look at things that are not us and to see an essential part of our story in them and to be emotionally moved by the astonishment of the more than human world, the, you know, the awe, but also the precarious, catastrophic nature of that world right now because of, because of, 
our own behaviors as a species. Uh, to answer the question about researching, it was a lot harder to write about the underwater world than it was to write about forests and trees. And because, you know, I could move to the Smokies and I could live in two million acres of forest and walk through it and stop in front of a tree and come back to it day after day and watch what it's doing in every season. You know, not to mention reading 120 books about trees, I could actually be in the world that I was describing. The ocean is a lot harder to know. The bibliography is a lot smaller. The, the sum of our knowledge is much smaller because we can only be very fleeting visitors there. And mm. it was also very challenging to write dramatically about it because for the same reasons, you know, most of the readers of this book will never have the experience of looking upwards through 30 feet of water and seeing a manta ray who can measure 30 feet from the tip of one wing to the, to the other wing swimming above them. That, to make that vivid and to make it immediate and, and, and visceral is a lot harder uh, because it's not our world. It's, it's, a, it's a domain where we will never be anything more than just very transient visitors. And I think one of the most fascinating themes of the book to me uh, is the concept of play and subsequently playgrounds. And I, how would you define play, either in general or specifically in the context of the book? I told you about uh, this, this book on coral reefs that my older sister gave me when I was a kid. Just before I started to immerse myself in this book, that sister died. And in remembering her life, in thinking about all my interactions with her, I was really struck by a kind of playfulness at the heart of my sister Peg that I really wanted to enshrine in this story that I was that, that I was writing so that th this book would actually be a kind of remembrance of something of her spirit. And the more I started thinking about play and playfulness in human beings, the more I began to think about the way that that plays out, an interesting uh, uh, but not incidental uh, use of that word, in, in the world beyond us. And I, I remembered a, a, a work of nonfiction that I had read in college uh, by the Dutch art historian, uh, Johan Huizinga. And the book's called Homo Ludens. It's not especially well known anymore in the US, but it's an absolutely fundamental look at, at the way that human culture grows up and through and around the impulse to play. And, and Huizinga starts this book by saying, there is an impulse in, in human beings that's much older than culture, and in fact is older than humanity. And he says that impulse is, is the impulse to play. And you know, the, to me that was like, how could, how could playing be older than humanity? But in fact, he goes on to, to, to show many, many cases uh, which have subsequently been vastly enlarged of animals using play as a way to socialize themselves, as a way to grow into their own skills, as a way of learning how to survive the world. That play becomes this evolutionary mechanism for fitness. And as I started to remember Heisinger, I also remembered a, a book that I had read many, many years afterwards by James P. Carse called Finite and Infinite Games. And this is a much more philosophical work. This is a work about human self-realization or self-discovery or self-exploration, in which Carr says you can approach the world basically as a finite game that needs to be won or an infinite game whose purpose is to keep on playing. And as I began to put those all together, I thought the common denominator here is that 
life itself is playing as a way of unfolding, as a way of solving the crisis of responding to change, as a way of driving growth, of driving uh, learning, and to see to see existence in the world as a kind of not a finite game to be won, which is the way that we human beings have been approaching it for a while, but as a as something whose goal is to figure out how to keep on playing, that all of a sudden that brought these disparate stories together. It gave me a, a sense of thematic clarity about what the, the the story was trying to say about life here on Earth, and it also turned the writing of the book into a game. So you know, you, I have these two characters who bond over play, over over games. But the, the book further explores every way that human beings play with each other. You know, we play with words, uh, we play with possibilities, uh, we play with fire, you know, we put on plays, uh, narratives themselves are a form of, of play, you know, we, we play God, and, you know, to, to explore all of these different aspects of Homo Ludens became, for me, uh, not only a recreation, a personal recreation, but a kind of daily recreation as I was working on the story. That's such a fantastic description and explanation of that. I like when I was just thinking about thinking about this book and thinking about those themes, I'm like connecting to my, you know, my past as a literature major undergrad and thinking like I would have loved writing a term paper about this book and that theme and exploring that because it's just so rich but i think what you said about this notion of are we playing to win as fast as we can are we playing in order to keep playing is kind of sort of the under like one of the major questions i feel like of the present moment and of the 21st century because it increasingly seems that our world our society a lot of our culture is being shaped by a handful of individuals who are very much playing to win. They're not playing to keep playing. They're playing to win as fast as they can. Uh, whereas it seems to be that we really need to focus and shift gears on, well, we need to kind of keep playing. So we got to make sure that this is sustainable. It can keep going forward and not just something that it's meant to consume as much and earn as much as you can and hoard in the short term. And I thought it was really interesting because I think the the one of the aspects of play and playground that I was thinking about was the sandbox and the aspect of allowing being able to live in your imagination or do whatever you want, sort of as in the playground, in the sandbox, without necessarily the consequence of the teacher or principal coming after you and saying you can't do that or no. And that was making me think about the one character, Todd, who we've been talking about, who this isn't really much of a spoiler, but he does go on to become one of these kinds of tech giant tycoons. And I was curious to hear, what did you learn about these kinds of people while you were writing this book, while you were writing Todd? I know that Todd has, you know, you, you've said that Todd, part of Todd it comes from your own psyche is partially you. I think it's fair to say that you yourself are not a tech tycoon type. You you are a different variety. But what is it about this group of people, these hand, this handful of individuals that seem more interested in, like the more money that they make, they seem the less interested in regulations or, you know, playing that game to keep the game going. What's going on with these guys? What do you think? Yeah. First of all, you know, the way you began uh, your comments uh, about the geopolitics of play uh, was really right on the money. And it made me think, you know, how the, the 19th century high watermark of colonialism was always referred to as the great game. The captains of industry and the, the leaders, the the political leaders of the principal colonial nation, the player, the principal players, as we would say, looked on the world as a kind of giant chessboard or, a, a, you know, in, a, in the 
terms I use in uh, playground, uh, a go board might be more appropriate. But right. they, you know, they're they're putting their pieces, you know, their geopolitical pieces, in play, and uh, they're looking, as you say, to win the world. The the the, the prize is dominance. The prize is, you know, goes to the victor. In this kind of neo-colonial world that we're living in now, those players, right? And you know, we we use the word all the time without even thinking of the you know, the metaphorical origin of it. Uh, a lot of them are coming out of Silicon Valley. A lot of them are these uh, tech bros who see a new great game unfolding, but the game is over data. The game is over information, which are the new currencies of this unfolding game for dominance of the world. And and this this story sees Makatea as a kind of playing piece in this uh, unfolding attempt uh, to push forward into an unregulated space, into a, a, a game with higher and higher stakes and larger and larger payouts to the victors. But the, the, the book is really trying to explore as well the ways in which these 80 islanders, which is pretty close to the actual population of the real world Makatea, on this four square mile island, what, what moves do they have to counter uh, the, in, in this very, very asymmetrical game to, to, to try to subvert the finite game that these tech giants are playing and try to convert it back into an infinite game. And of course, Makatea confronted with this, this choice of futures, you know, do you allow these seasteaders to come in and revive your island and uh, bring in great uh, needed goods and services, build a hospital, build a school, build you know, a library, allow, allow people to live on this island in a in a robust way that they haven't been able to since its decimation? Or do you turn your back on it and say, no, we're gonna let this island continue to try to recuperate uh, and uh, rebuild after its first brush with the great game? And you know, I wanted to write that story in a way that didn't have a clear moral right answer, mm -hmm. but that was also concerned with, you know, this process by which you can get out of the terms of the game as are dictated to you and try to find a way of, of letting it open up into, into a, a much more robust and much more surprising kind of project, kind of uh, exploration. And so a lot of the book is about changing the nature of the game or seeing, uh, seeing the game from a different perspective. It's not giving away too much that artificial intelligence becomes a fairly crucial component in the way that this game plays out. I would also say you know, that uh, Todd, who is definitely in this elite cadre of people who are playing with the future of mankind by the instruments that they're creating, his motivations and his desires once he's discovered that he's not going to win the game because of a diagnosis of Lewy body dementia you know in in his 50s once he once he realizes he's not getting over the finish line with all his stuff the way in which todd comes from childhood into adulthood in the way that he goes from the world of Silicon Valley into this uh, drama of Makatea make it a surprising. I think it, it, you know, you want to look at this guy and you want to hate him. You want to see someone who is oblivious to the, the the harm that he's causing, who's arrogant about the power that he's using. But I think ultimately, I want to write a book that humanized even his mistaken game. And and even you know even his misguided uh, attempt to solve his life, insofar as Makatea is facing this uh, this binary choice of which game to play, 
it becomes a kind of microcosm for all of us, for, for those of us who are living on any part of this very small island called Earth. Is there a way of rethinking the goals of capitalism that are set to us as the victory conditions of the game? Is there a way of subverting that, of taking control back and turning the, the, the finite game of accumulation, commodity acquisition, into the infinite game of remembering what, where we're living and being a part of this big interdependent reciprocal process of, of you know, a metabolizing planet? Yeah, it's a, it's, I, I was thinking about uh, Makatea being a microcosm for just kind of the world overall and kind of that dilemma. And to your point, like there's, it's hard to come down on one particular side on the, of, of, from the ethical perspective of saying like, well, if you embrace capitalism or continue to allow us to exploit your resources, you may benefit in the form of these much needed goods and services that will improve your quality of life and make your life a lot more comfortable. But the risk of that or the opposite side is that you may further be jeopardizing the natural resources that you have and the things that are kind of maybe don't come with a price tag or maybe can't be commodified in that kind of way. And what is the value of that? And obviously it's challenging because if we're going back to the the playing metaphor, the the players who have all of the money and resources and influence are getting louder and louder and more powerful every day. It's just like they're adding more, more pieces to their arsenal. And it's like the other side, it almost feels like is losing pieces or doesn't have like how you compare to something, especially when like AI kind of enters the novel in that sort of piece. It's how, what exactly are we supposed to do with this information? And we're just kind of in this moment of time in the world, we're just inundated with all these new technologies that are changing so fast that we don't even have a chance to process or figure out the best way to use these things or to what end we're using them. And it's, they just create so many, so many questions and so many problems to try to figure out. There is so much more that I would love to talk about and unpack in the book, but I did want to move back to the oceans because it's such a pivotal part. I think maybe, you know, one of my favorite parts of the book, clearly there's an emotion emotional attachment for you with that as well in your mind like I know you've spoken about it a little bit so far but what is the value of further exploring and learning about the oceans like why should we do that it's a beautiful question and it's a question you know it's a question at the heart <laughs> of human existence I mean if we are living on a water planet where 99 percent of the biosphere is underwater, then we absolutely want to know as much as we can about what the conditions and terms and processes of life are under, under that surface. It, the problem is, you know, inside the, 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 the capitalist frame, inside the frame of our culture, all of the, all of the values that we inherit and normalize, it's there's a great temptation to instrumentalize the ocean and say, well, we need to learn about it because we need to make use of it. You know, that's true. But to say, you know, we need to study the ocean in order to keep our fish stocks high, so that we can continue, you know, to to consume as much as 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 we would like, is to tell a very very small part of the story. I mean. Do we want to know who we are? How do we find meaning in, in life? And isn't, isn't an understanding of the way in which our lives are contingent on th this vast place that we can't penetrate and we can't really know as well as we would like, it, it becomes an almost metaphysical motivation. We should attend to the ocean and study it and contemplate it and revere it and give it our poetic attention because it can it can generate the kinds of meaning that the forms of life that we're leading right now aren't giving us 
It's, it's a way to, to know the ocean and to, to think about and to bring it into your own sensibility is, is, to, is to give you a kind of fulfillment and a kind of peace in some ways um, that a narrower focus can't, can't supply. Uh, so there is, you know, there, there are as many reasons for wanting to know more, wanting to continue to, to attend to and be reverent toward uh, the ocean as there are human motivations. You know, whatever it is that we're looking for, we can find some part of the answer to that by being more broadly aware of what the conditions of life are on this planet and that means being more broadly aware of where most of the life on the planet actually lives one of the uh really amazing privileges of getting to host this podcast the show for barnes and noble on occasion is getting to speak with you know authors like yourself who have such a really beautiful perspective on things and there's kind of i I've noticed a pattern going like from the episodes and the authors that I've spoken to, which I think are all kind of connected and can sort of all be united under the same theme. I spoke to Merlin Sheldrake about his book, uh, Entangled Life, which is about fungi. I spoke to Zoe Schlanger uh, about her book, The Light Eaters, which is all about plants. Thinking about what you're saying about the ocean and how in, in all these books is sort of that humans, we need to get out of our own way sort of and pretty fast we pretty pretty quickly need to get out of our own way and kind of buck history and human culture and the human centric perception of everything and this idea that the ocean is just the blank space in between where the people are like as if the land land is incredibly important but it's not just the nothingness in between it's actually its own thing and that is true, I think, whether you're talking about fungi or plants or animals or anything that's not human, is that we could do a better job of being stewards, is how I think of it, is that we have the privilege to be stewards of these things, to be better neighbors and to support them. What do you think? Obviously, the ocean is massive. There's, it's facing huge challenges. But for the listeners at home, what do you think is something tangible that we can do to take better care of the oceans right now? Let me, let me uh, work my way back to that by first talking about the kind of uh, kinship that you were noticing among a lot of writers on, on the show who were all working to rescue us from this sort of parochial vision of human exceptionalism and who all were working to broaden our, our understanding of our own connectivity to, to the, the more than human world. There, there are so many writers now uh, who have c come to the realization that that could be one of the central projects of consciousness, right, of human consciousness right now, to become more and more deeply and richly and uh, subtly and variously aware of what the, what the Buddhists call interbeing or what uh, life scientists call interdependence. You could take novelists as desperate as, as uh, Barbara Kingsolver and Kim Stanley Robinson. You, know, you, you would never think to group them together in, in a taxon, but they're both profoundly committed to this idea of seeing us situated inside a larger story, right? And nonfiction writers like Robin Wall Kimmerer and her beautiful work on reciprocity and interdependence, we are belatedly, let's hope not too belatedly, coming to realize that we have looked for an understanding for ourselves in a vacuum. We have for too long been focused entirely on psychology and sociology and politics as a way of knowing ourselves. Not only is the ocean not just a, a, a separating boundary between places where you know, of real human concern, it is the place where we can get the most profound understanding of ourselves. That is by, by, it, it, by understanding in the richest and most diverse ways, most comprehensive ways, the way that our fate is dependent on the fate 
of these spaces. And our story is inseparable from the story that came up out of those places. So to understand psychology, to understand evolution, to understand geopolitics, we need to stop thinking of ourselves as the story and start thinking of ourselves as a small component of a much larger process of unfolding. And, you know, isn't that, isn't that the comfort and meaning that religions give us? You know, religion, uh, the, the, the etymology of the word means tying back together. To tie ourselves back together to places that we were previously just instrumentalizing and just seeing as, as raw native, you know, uh, raw materials and resources for a separate story. To, to tie ourselves back into a much larger story it, it is a source of meaning. Now, this idea of how do we rehabilitate this place that we've reduced and diminished so profoundly, the first step comes with learning how to receive and to tell stories of interdependence. So you can actually help to read habilitate the world by transforming your own consciousness from one that focuses on human separatism and sees us as a kind of you know filling uh, filling the frame of uh, stories that need to be told and you can start learning how to identify with larger scale temporal processes and geographical and, and geological processes you can start simply reading, and thinking and telling stories that are more richly connected to the more than human world. And what that, what that turns into is more meaning and less hunger, less hunger, less appetite, less appetite, less pressure on the resources of this world, right? In, instead of looking for your meaning through, you know, these commodity mediated processes where you, in order to win the game, you have to have higher and higher scores. If instead you can shift your consciousness to the infinite game that the ocean is still playing and will always play, you will be more capable of feeling joy and getting gratification without living a life that puts such profound pressures on the continuation, you know, the, 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 the resources, the dwindling resources that are available to us. And, you know, it's, it's an odd thing. I don't know what your reaction was, but as I was writing this book, I mean, it's not, it, it's, it's not a Pollyanna book. It doesn't turn a blind eye mm -hmm. to how drastically the oceans have been reduced by human activity. But weirdly, despite the, the, the vision playing, the darkness playing around the edges of the story, this acknowledgement, of how profoundly the ocean has been damaged by human activity. It's, a, it's an oddly hopeful book. I mean, you get to the end of it and you think there, there's, some, there's some strange uplift to the story where you just say there is an ingenuity to life. There, there are these immense processes and whatever happens to us, those processes will always be the dominant game, the game that is going to be played in an undiminished fashion. And I, you know, I think in some ways the book is spiritually reaffirming because it's saying we have to confront the destiny of our species in the same way that we confront our personal mortality. You know, knowing that we will each die separately doesn't diminish our capacity for joy and meaning in our individual lives. Nor should the crises that we have, the catastrophes, calamities that we have unleashed in the world, nor should they deprive us of the ability to live joyfully and meaningfully with an eye toward rehabilitating the diminished world. That that in itself is a game worth playing. I... Can, could not have said it any better myself. I certainly absolutely cannot. Um, I think that sums up the book terrifically. I wish we could chat all day. I love swimming around in your brain. This has been a privilege. It's been an honor. 
before we wrap up, I did have one last question for you, which uh, you actually alluded to, I think, at the beginning when we first started talking. Um, but I did notice that it, we are coming up on the 40th anniversary of the release of your first ever novel. And so as we're closing things up, I was wondering if you could go back in time 40 years and talk to that Richard, knowing what you know now, what kind of advice would you give to yourself at that time? Oh, be fearless, forgive yourself, enjoy, you know, um, engage as robustly as you can. You know, I, I think that's timeless advice, you know, not, not only for any novelist at any point in, in his or her career, but just for, for people making their private way. You know, there, there is a much, much larger game that you're part of and will always be part of. And don't be afraid to, to, to play and participate in that as robustly as you can. So it all comes back. We circled all the way back to play, right? Everything comes back to play at the end of the day. Once again, the new book is called Playground. It is available now at your local Barnes & Noble store and online at bn.com. If you like beautifully written and thought-provoking works of literary fiction listener, you're going to love this. If you enjoyed the conversation that we had today, I think you're really going to like this book. I'm confident that it's going to be on all of the best of all of the best of lists of the year uh, in a few months, and it's going to generate quite a lot of buzz this fall. So you absolutely do not want to miss out. Richard, you've been incredibly generous with your time and your words and your thought, and I really appreciate uh, the opportunity that you've given us. I really enjoyed this, um, and I nothing but the best with the new book, and I look forward to what you do next. Thanks so much, Chris. It's been a delight. All right. Take care. You too. Bye. Hello readers, it's time for another TBR Top Off. We're going to recommend a couple of fantastic books to pick up when you stop in for your copy of Playground by Richard Powers. I'm Mark at my Barnes & Noble in Cincinnati, and I'm joined by one of my favorite book buddies, Donald. Hello. But I'm going to go ahead and kick things off. Uh, the two of us could probably talk about Richard Powers for, I don't know, three days and still not scratch the surface of how much we really, really love him. But I want to shift to some other options that are equally delicious. I am recommending the book Orbital by Samantha Harvey. Oh, God, this book was so good. It was long listed for the Booker Prize this year, and rightfully so. It is a slim little stunner. The book blends the beauty of our planet and our cosmos with the absolute invaluable need for human connection, which right there on paper is just a mark book automatically waiting to happen we spend time with a group of astronauts and cosmonauts as they are orbiting the earth the book takes place over a single day of this project journey that they're on and it really ripples in a way that i think the themes of human connection, the theme of cosmos and the large and small and the zooming into something intimate and zooming way out to make you feel so tiny, I think just spans eons. It's, this is something that I think universally is going to be a book that is thought about for many, many, many years to come. The vastness uh, of the conceptual pieces of this book are really just beautifully complemented by the small, intimate moments that we get to glimpse. I love the pacing of this book. It works really, really nicely. It is just a little over 200 pages. It flies, but I really had to slow myself down because the sentences are crystalline and perfect. You just feel the full scope of the cosmos while also feeling this delicate scope um, that humanity has to offer and how fragile we are and how big we are too. It's, I, I could probably rave about it in hyperbole for the next several hours, but I will just say the book is a must. Please check out Orbital by Samantha Harvey. Donald, what do you have for us? All right. So I have um, State of Wonder by Anne Paddington. Quickly talking about Richard Powers, like, his ability, especially in Playground, to take on such a large canvas in such a few amount of pages has always just bewildered me, I guess, so to speak, right? Because 
There's so much and, and so little. But Ann Patchett also does that. She can take a really big type of idea and story and make it so entertaining. You connect so deeply with the characters. And State of Wonder really was the first one that came to mind when I thought, other than Richard Power's own books, <laughs> what would be a great um, recommendation for Playground? Both of them deal with science and nature and spirituality. That's where I found the connection, right? So in Playground, it takes place in the world's largest ocean on an island. State of Wonder takes place in the insect-infested Amazon. So you're, you're already thrown into places we're not as familiar with as everyday you know, people on the street. So you're thrown into these worlds, but yet everything they experience, everything they go through, every challenge, you can find somebody in your own life that is dealing with something very similar, confronting memories and sacrifices. And the spiritual transformation that we take when we're thrown into situations that are not, we're not comfortable with, that we're, again, bewildered by. I've got to throw that bewilderment in there, right? And how we're part of the ecosystem. So just like the Amazon, just like the oceans, we are as part of an integral as that to the ecosystem as the plants and animals that, that live there and all the other experience that they have. Science, nature, our world, and our place in it, and how science and spirituality really aren't separate. So much of it is entwined together. And in State of Wonder, that's a really big piece of, her, of Anne Patchett's book, is how this world helps define who we are as human beings. And I think that that's Playground's intent as well. So my pick again was State of Wonder by Anne Patchett. If you've not read her, she's new to you. She likes to say that. So pick up her book. Absolutely agree. That's, I think that is my favorite Ann Patchett book. I love Bel Canto, but that one just did something for me. And maybe I'm just a sucker for, I don't even know if there's a term for it, where it has big scope, nature, planet related things coupled with something small and intimate and close, maybe like a zoom in, zoom out kind of book. I don't know if there's a term for it, but that's, that's my yummy spot when it comes to books. So Nice choice, as always. But that is all we have for today. Thanks so much for tuning in to Port Over. And please make sure to give us a rating and subscribe so you don't miss any episodes. You can also follow us on our socials at Barnes & Noble. Pretty simple. I'm Mark. You can follow my home store at BN Westchester. Donald, where can we find you? You can find me at BN Fairlane Green. All right, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Enjoy that Richard Powers and come back for more. Happy reading. Bye. Thank you for listening. Poured Over is a Barnes & Noble production. To help other readers find us, please rate and review the show wherever you listen to podcasts.